Afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to our session chairs and for the sages for the opportunity to speak on this. Um, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective, uh, just as a fun, any disclosures, there's uh, no relevance to my one disclosure. Briefly, I'm going to talk about uh, moving into the virtual space. Like everything, when the pandemic hit, everything had to move virtual. Well, advocacy is among the same thing that happened. We had to continue doing it and figure out how to be effective at it and still protect our patients and our profession. Um, it wasn't easy to do. I will tell you, I had a lot of experience during the pandemic. Uh, last year, one of my roles was the president of the Arizona Medical Association, so representing close to 4,000 physicians for the state during a pandemic was an interesting time interacting with the government. Uh, you know, when you think of Arizona, stable and science believing are not the two things that go to the pop top of your head. So it made it quite of a challenge to interact with them, especially when you had to do it in a virtual environment. And I'll talk about a little bit how we did it on the federal level as well. But again, we moved rapidly into the virtual environment, it allowed us to do that with calls and with Zoom calls and hearings and frequent communications, email and phone, things we already did. So some of it was already old hat, no problem, but others we had to kind of move into with our interactions, make it more virtual. Uh, again, I talked about the state and federal level, but other things we, as I personally realized as we went through this, there were certain avenues we were not leveraging more. Uh, I'm gonna go a little backwards. First, we did virtual town halls. That's something we interacted with our members about and it brought in legislators as well as other stakeholders and really had these interesting interactions, webinars that we use for our organization to really move and interact with our members across different areas. Uh, the social media platforms you just heard about, there are ways to leverage and get information out there. Uh, there are good and bad points to that, but again, it's a way to reach a large group of people. And one thing I'm really pushing and some of you have talked about before is I don't think we're using media enough, and I mean local media. So again, in my role as president of ARMA, I had the ample opportunity to do many TV interviews and media interviews, national, international, but a lot, the majority was local. In fact, I was up until two hours ago, I just gave one to a local TV station because what happened is I did so many local media interviews, the, the reporters have my cell phone number, my email, they reach out, you become credible to them. And all politics are local, well, one thing to do is to get in touch in front of your patients, not just your patients, but everyone's patients as a credible source of information. The media is a really good way of doing it. TV, newspaper, doing op-eds, doing interviews. The trick is learning how to talk and give that information in short little bursts, but it can be done and you can have significant impact. I knew I was making uh, an impact when all of a sudden patients I was seeing for the first time were telling me, oh, I saw you already, I saw you on TV talking about this or that. And I, you know, when the DoorDash delivery driver asked me about vaccines, I knew I was making some sort of impact in the community. But again, we are reaching to a larger audience. And I will tell you, a politician will respond to their constituents. And if the public knows who you are and believes what you say, that gives you significant leverage to advocate for what you need to get done. Talking about what happens in Arizona, the House and the Senate went virtual for all of their hearings, which made things very interesting. If you thought it was difficult to talk to a politician face to face, Zoom was an interesting way of doing it, but again, you did see them, you did interact with them, it was effective. All the processes though remain the same, committee hearings, signing up, doing all that stuff was just done in a virtual format. So I guess you can say you didn't have to fully get dressed up in a suit, you can just wear the, the top part and wear shorts while you're sitting on Zoom talking about an issue you wanna advocate for, but everything still was done, they're still taking notes, they're still voting, they're still responding to what you have to say. We also did a lot of things besides behind the scenes, right? Calling emails like we normally did with our lobbyists, but we were making frequent calls. Personally, I was making frequent calls to the government's, governor's office, right? COVID was a rapidly changing problem. Arizona, we became the worst place in the, in the world in July of last year, so it required frequent calls with multiple stakeholders over periods of time, but they were willing to do it and sit down over phone, email, Zoom, you name it, to get this done. And finally, one thing we created at ARMA were these things called the ARMA ambassadors. So we have a legislative and government affairs committee. We took all of our members, assigned them a, at least one state representative and one state senator, and they became email buddies. They would email out saying, hey, there's certain issues we want you to be aware of. We wouldn't overwhelm them with emails, but we would do it when there's an issue or concern we want to bring up, direct contact with state representatives. They are responsive, especially on the state level, they rely on us to give them appropriate information and we were able to provide that through this ambassador program. We had some wins. Uh, one, a couple that you can see listed up there that we were able to restore Medicaid rates to pre-recession levels. That was about a 15% increase in the rate for certain physicians who served Medicaid in Arizona. The telehealth legislation, I could tell you I was personally involved in writing that bill, providing input on it. Uh, the governor, that was his big omnibus bill that he wanted to do, and we spent months crafting it with multiple stakeholders. I met with insurance companies, you know, 
it's one time you're allowed to yell at an insurance company. It felt pretty good. I highly recommend it. And we really were able to get an omnibus telehealth bill passed in Arizona where now we have pay parity for all audiovisual visits across the board. That is state law. As well as we had formed a regulate, uh, regulatory commission that will now oversee and make sure that best, best practices are done in the state. I know because of my participation, the governor actually appointed me to it, so we have a surgeon who sits on there to make sure that things like audio-only visits are considered in certain areas and to make sure that we don't uh, have issues regarding network advocacy or anything like that. We passed things to protect retaliatory actions from third-party hospital contractors. We streamlined the prior authorization forms. This really upset the insurance company, so we did something right. But now there's a standard form across all insurance companies regarding forms for medications, forms for equipment. Instead of trying to figure out how the insurance company wants to do it, they must use this single entity that we all are going to use across the board. And then we also were able to codify into law that we had executive uh, orders for protections from liability from COVID, they're now state law that directly related to COVID, we have liability protection so our physicians can work and not be concerned about that. I mentioned communications. We went to, we did 15, uh, 15 virtual town halls with invited experts that ranged from our local Department of Health Services to CMS to our state legislators to members of, you can name it, of insurance companies. We even had the president of the AMA at the time, Dr. Patrice Harris, do one to give an update at what was going on on the federal level. We usually had anywhere between 50 to 100 people on each time, and our members were able to participate in these formats. We sent multiple letters to people, uh, to Governor Ducey, to our uh, uh, Director Kara Christ of DHS, to our mayors, sent one to the sheriff's office asking to please, you know, to honor what the cities were doing regarding masking. We really went across the board to communicate as much as we could. We did multiple press releases, far more than we had done before. Again, a way to communicate with the public about our concerns and really make sure that we're staying in the forefront of their minds. And then we post published op-eds across the state, one in Tucson, one in Flagstaff, one in Yuma, on different issues in the pandemic, again, putting our name out there, putting our issues out there, making sure our patients know we're out there for them and that we're staying in front in, in their minds. Examples of some of the places that I got to do during the last 16 months, uh, again, you can tell I have got my format pretty good. I got the ring light set up. I've got my, the professional background of my office. But there's some of the places that actually reached out and called. And you get to have that credibility because you go on there and you talk about the issues and you interact in a, in a professional manner. You become recognized and have an uh, ability to impact. In fact, the Fox 10 Phoenix one, I've told people, I end up going on a weekly, their weekly morning show every Friday for eight months to give a 10 minute update on COVID, was going on in the hospital, and it was really a useful tool to provide information to the public when they had questions about masking, the vaccines. I even got my vaccine live on TV, did it twice, and then I actually tweeted about it every day, sent a little video telling them how I was feeling. Yes, I may want to joke and tell them I turned into a zombie. I didn't want to do that, obviously, and nor did I. But for 30 days, I published a little video to show the public and my patients that I was okay from the vaccine instead of them just telling them I showed them. Again, a way to connect with people just so they can see and feel comfortable about what's going on. Moving on to what we did at the federal level, especially with the American College of Surgeons, SAGES works closely with the ACS on these issues. We did stuff with still advocacy on the Hill with the administration of CMS. You heard previously talking about the Medicare payment physician issue. That was a, one of our big wins actually from last year that we have to do again this year. But we are also involved in coalitions, and one of them is the Surgical Care Coalition. CHS is actually a part of that. ACS uh, brought this group together using the Brunswick Group for a PR campaign to re-educate members of Congress what it is that we do for a living. They think surgery is easy because of all the technological and all the, the minimally invasive approaches that we have done. We needed to re-educate them on how this was done. So we joined with this group to do that. I talked about the, the physician uh, campaign. It was our highest grassroots participation ever in the American College of Surgeons. We had over 20,000 letters sent by more close to 4,500 advocates. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's out of 30,000 letters and 5,000 people participating for the year. So that was the majority. We had all the states participating and almost 2,000 new people doing it. We won and were able to get it done. How we did it, we engaged online. You heard about Surgeon's Voice. I highly recommend logging on. It's really easy. It's two clicks and you've sent a letter. Keep on doing that. And the letters get updated every week when the issue changes so you can keep on reaching out and notifying your member of Congress of what's going on. We also have a new program called Advocacy at Home where you can set up your own virtual meeting or face-to-face -face meeting with your member of Congress and senators. I did that two weeks ago. I met with 
all the member, uh, all of my representations in Arizona. It was easy. We worked around my schedule. We did it via Zoom. I met with them before. They knew me, so it was great. 20-minute conversations, and I got my issues across, no problem. Then I had other congressmen calling me on my phone for other reasons, but that's what happens. As you integrate and get into it, you can actually reach to multiple people and get your, your concerns across. So basically, again, we are able to easily shift into the virtual space as we did with everything else. It actually is a, not, it is a pretty easy thing to do. Uh, actually, people have had better meetings in the virtual space than face-to-face -face because if you go to the DC, they sometimes can be distracted by multiple meetings, multiple things going on. They're kind of trapped in a room with you virtually, so you can get really good interactions, and I highly recommend doing it. Face-to-face -face is nice, but there was a benefit. We were still effective, we still had an impact, and I guarantee you it will continue to be part of the advocacy effort as we move forward. As we evolve and we get better at this, it will become a natural part of what we do. Thank you again for the time, and I'm happy to answer any questions.